Thank you, Anthony. Whoever you are and wherever you may be on your own life's journey, you are welcome here at the Sunderland Congregational Church, a part of the United Church of Christ. Last uh, Sunday, Roman and I, we went to the annual meeting for the Franklin Association, and I bet you it's been 15 or 20 years at least since I heard Kumbaya sung in a liturgical event, but the closing prayer service had Kumbaya last weekend. Then I get the, uh, the music for today's bulletin from Anthony, and there's Kumbaya. I haven't heard it for 20 years. Now I've heard it back-to-back -back weekends, but this was much nicer than singing those same verses over and over and over again. So that was a very nice introduction to our worship. Uh, so at this point, if we could call Reverend Linda forward uh, for our first stewardship moment as we kick off our campaign for 2024 with the Reverend's Good Words. So most of you know me, I'm Reverend Linda Neese. I'm an interfaith, um, ordained interfaith minister and a member of this church. Um, and our church stewardship group asked me to speak today, which made me very happy. <laughs> I am grateful for the time we take each fall to reflect on the meaning, <clears throat> excuse me, of Christian stewardship as we prepare to make our pledges and financial support for our church. Hearing each other's stories and the reason why this church is so special to us really fills me with hope and love and community. There's a wonderful definition of the word stewardship. Stewardship, honoring our heritage and holding ourselves accountable for the human, financial, and natural resources entrusted to our care. This year, our stewardship theme for the UCC is because of you, our church changes lives. And why else would you come to church on Sundays and make gifts of our time and dollars unless all the contributions, <laughs> unless it all com contributed, sometimes my mouth just doesn't work, to enriching and transforming our own lives and the lives of others. This is so important. So let's stop for a second to reflect on some of these amazing ways our church helps others because of your loyal financial support. Weekly diaconate activities, things the deacons do, that make sure our worship services come together, preparing for communion, reaching out to visitors, and helping with whatever the ministry needs. Randy, Reverend Randy's visits to the elderly and those who are sick in the hospital. Uh, Elaine Fuqua's Christian Concerns activities, sending flowers and cards to the bereaved or ill. The funerals and baptisms we hold, our prayer list, Julie Cavecchio and Carol Cushy's Community Meals Program, making free lunches once a month for the elderly neighbors and anyone who requests them. And Roger and I have been benefited from that a couple of times, and they have been delicious. Pancake breakfast and the community fellowship opportunities they provide, our serendipity shop and low-cost clothing that makes available to our community, and the food tree, and the Christmas gifts, and the meals for families in need at Sunderland Elementary School. We'll have more on that on next Sunday. <clears throat> and especially dear to my heart is our church's ongoing support of the Center for New Americans, though through the gift card donations. And as you know, I am a teacher at Center for New Americans. And I have to tell you that through, through COVID, during the time of COVID, was raging. Um, this church's donations really saved quite a few families that had lost their jobs and a couple of them lost their homes and it was the generosity of, of this church and, and other, other churches and, and community organizations that really saved those, those immigrants and refugees. Right now we have an influx of Haitian uh, refugees and um, they are just so 
in need. <laughs> so every gift that you give, every time you buy a card from from uh, Kathy and say, you know, contribute it to whoever needs it, it makes a difference in those people's lives. I came from poverty as a child. I know what it's like to not have food. I watched my mother make, you know, supper for five people out of one can of Campbell's soup. You know, I, it's, it's not good. It leaves you with a feeling that nobody cares. But then you have things like suddenly somebody comes to the door and brings a box of food to your house from the church and you realize people do care. People, you know, people really see us and they want to help us. And so that's what you have done, each and every one of you. And I want to thank you for my students as well as for the rest of the community because I know personally how much that means. Over the next three Sundays, we will explore more ways our churches change his lives because of each and every one of you. I'll close with this short passage of scripture that gets to the heart of stewardship. Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together. Blessings to all of you. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Rebecca. That was wonderful. And, and um, I got to tell you, for the size of this congregation, as Reverend Linda highlighted, you know, one of the easiest ways to uh, meet your stewardship goal or to meet your budget would be to slash some of these, um, these, these donations and, and offerings that we give to others beyond us that's never come up here. You just seem to do more. And so you should take a lot of pride in that, as Reverend Linda had mentioned. And that really is what we're all about as church, is this trying to live into the gospel of Jesus. Um, so that's a wonderful opening stewardship uh, message, and, and I hope we do take it to heart as we think about how we will pledge for 2024. May we now turn to our opening hymn in candle lighting. It's red hymnal number 433, God of our fathers, whose almighty hand.
now turn to our bulletins for the call to worship. Let us put away the things we have substituted for God. Let our worship be genuine and motivated by God's love for us. We seek to know God better through our time together as a church. The ministry of our souls. God is not deceived by meaningless words and actions. We impress God by following the gospel lived and taught by Jesus. We want to give choice expression to the glory of the day. We choose to serve God and reveal who Jesus is the Our hope is in God's grace beyond all judgment. Our trust is in God's love. Our inspiration is God's mercy and kindness. We welcome the light Jesus promises with us. We seek to walk more in the light of Christ now coming together as this congregation in person, and those joining us live on Zoom and those later via FCAT, our unison prayer. God of our ancestors, be our God today as we gather in sincerity and faithfulness in order to honor you. Attune our hearts to your still speaking word as we encounter the presence of Jesus at worship. Declare your word to us so that we may be inspired to follow its holy revelations. We know that we must make our choice in life of whether or not we will follow you and lead lives of Christian service. Help us to recognize the blessings we give and receive when we live as Jesus lived. Help us to be ready when our faith calls us to action. Help us to keep the light of our faith burning so that we may lead others with us in a joyful procession to prepare for that blessed time when we live fully in the peace and love of Christ. scripture reading is from Amos chapter 5 verses 18 through 24. Alas for you who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness not light. As if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your heart, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. So just briefly, I'll, I'll share a couple of thoughts uh, for the young people who may be watching via FCAT later. Um, when I was a kid, probably you as well, we used to have all these fire drills, and you knew when you heard that alarm, you knew what to do, your teachers knew what to do, you know where to go and all that, and you, so you recognized the sounds, you, you were prepared for the possibility that maybe there was a real fire, and then, you know, when you heard the other sound, you knew you could go back into the class, and so you had those drills to prepare for the possibility of what could happen, and by having a fire drill, it doesn't mean that you were kind of, you know, 
almost increasing the chance of having a fire. Sometimes I think that people think if you prepare for something, it's almost like it's inevitable that's going to happen. But that's not the way it works. If you have a fire drill, it's to help you be prepared in case there ever is a fire. And so Jesus is going to tell us in a little bit about this uh, idea of being prepared. And, you know, the kids today, they've got their fire drills. They've got these, these shooter drills that they have to worry about and everything else. And so I think the, the fire drill is one thing, that shooter drill, that would freak me out if I knew I was a kid and had to worry about something like that. And, and, you know, they've got all these things. When I was a kid, we also used in Westfield, there would be this, um, every Friday at noon, the, those sirens would go off because we had to worry about nuclear war. Now that's coming back into the story. All of that message about be prepared doesn't mean we think that's going to happen. We're hoping that it never does. And so when Jesus says be prepared, it's not to scare us. It's more that message of let's get ready for the time if it ever does happen. And so we come to church, we go to Sunday school, we go to Bible class, and it's all that message of be prepared for that time when somehow, some point, we're really going to need to rely on God and we can't go seeking God. We're just going to have to know what to do on automatic. Just like those when the fire alarm went off, you knew exactly what you had to do without thinking. And so the same thing, we come to church, we do all these things, we have prayer lives, we do all the things that Reverend Linda talked about, so that it almost becomes like second nature to us, that we know in our times of desperation, when we have to be prepared, we just go into this mode and our faith lives have prepared us for that. So there will be times in our lives when we need God to be especially close. And so we need to think about ordinary Sundays like this on a beautiful November day when we just come to church and we can rest in the peacefulness of God, that this is preparing us for those times when we really need God to be close. So these are times and these are messages that can start from young people and they can go all the way up until whatever age because it's always that, that comfort to know that when we need God, especially in desperate times, that God will be there. And so that's the message of today's reading that we'll hear a little bit later from the gospel. At this time, um, the anthem is Sing to the Lord of Harvest.
choir. Thank you, trumpet soloist. <laughs> Very nice. Now time for us to share in our joys, our celebrations, and our concerns. And I know we uh, already said thank you to um, the volunteers that worked all of this past week, um, literally all seven days of this past week. But I'd just like to add that into our, our prayers as well. Um, that, that goes above and beyond uh, what would be expected. And they do it, and they do it year after year, from the Mattawampi on Sunday, right through all of the shopping and preparation and cooking, and then outside in the cold, selling the last of the pies. Um, I got to tell you, I'm amazed and I'm exhausted just watching. And one of the ladies, and I won't say which, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I mentioned that to them at the uh, breakfast yesterday, and they said it's for the good of the church. And that just warmed me, you know, because there could be a lot of complaints about doing all those things, but they said it was for the good of the church. And so to all of you who did whatever you did um, throughout this past week, thank you, and, and God bless you for that. I'd also like to uh, mention... Um, we have a change in the yellow sheet. It's now the family of Prue um, O'Donovan, and we've always been praying for Prue, and she is uh, Judy's friend. And she is an Anglican minister uh, serving, I don't know how she left from here, but ended up in Australia, Australia or New Zealand? Australia. And um, yesterday at the breakfast, I got a chance to talk to Judy only briefly, but I got to share this story with you because, um, you know, as one minister to another, I would love to be able to go out like this. Um, so Prue is on hospice care and she's, uh, you know, failing and she knows that her time is limited and the family has come and her friends have come together. Um, all these different people that she has served and all those different churches, they're all coming in. And, and one person was going through uh, their own, you know, time of turmoil. And as that person was meeting with Reverend Prue, uh, Reverend Prue, on her deathbed, literally, is ministering to this other person who came to her to offer her condolences and instead ended up being served by Reverend Prue. And as she left, she told the family this, and, and then they came in and asked Reverend Prue about that, you know, did you you know, minister to her at this time? And she said, yeah, that's what I do. And that's the difference between a calling and a job. When it's something that just defines who you are, whether you are in a pulpit dressed in a robe or whether you are on a street or if you are on your deathbed, um, that's, that's something to be proud of. And, and so Reverend Prue has now uh, definitely gone on to her heavenly reward and we keep her in our thoughts and prayers. And so thank you for sharing uh, that with me yesterday. I found that to be uh, uplifting. Um, so let me also share these prayers, uh, moving from that kind of positive stuff to prayers for Ukraine and those affected by the war between Israel and Hamas. Um, you know, it's just the savagery that we see on our screens of the innocents that usually take the brunt of these conflicts, uh, the ones that are drafted and called to fight, uh, even though they probably would choose not to, but, you know, people with power tell them to. Uh, so we, we pray for peace in our world, Ukraine, the Holy Land, everywhere, because it's always uh, those who suffer uh, the most are the ones who least want war. We also continue to pray for our nation as we face the reality of persistent and institutional racism. Prayers are also offered for friends of mine, uh, Richard, matter of fact, who just celebrated his wedding anniversary yesterday. Uh, he had to get married on Veterans Day because I think uh, he was drafted and, and his young wife of 18, they wanted to get married before he went off to Vietnam. And so Veterans Day is also their anniversary. So prayers for Richard, prayers for Joseph, and one who is battling a severe blood disorder, disorder as well, that they all may enjoy quick and full recoveries. And of course, prayers for Evelyn Gregonis, uh, who passed away last week and whose funeral will be tomorrow. May she rest in peace and may the family find comfort in their faith. Um, I only knew Evelyn later in life, um, already at the nursing home, uh, but there was a contagious smile and just this uh, joy of life even there on that nursing home bed. So she must have been something in her day. And so I hope those memories also add to your comfort. Are there any other uh, joys, celebrations, concerns? You, yes, Judy. I have a joy to share. The um, Frontier Red Hawks Pee Wee won their Super Bowl yesterday. All right, well, congratulations. And any personal connection with the Frontier Regional Pee Wee? <laughs> All right, well, congratulations. How, um, how, how did the Frontier Girls uh, field hockey do? 
Anybody know? I, I saw they, they, were, they made it into uh, quarterfinals or something like that, but I, I don't know. I have to check on that. Any, any other joy celebration concerns? Where you're pointing where? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just, I forgot to say it when I was up there. I just wanted to thank uh, Lisa and Lisa and Lisa for sending me a, a script to, to read off of and to, to uh, add to. Uh, thank you for your work on that. Thank you. <laughs> so. Very nice. Anything else, anyone? Okay. Yellow sheet time. Let us offer our prayers for Alan, Alice, Anne, Antonia, and family, Art, Bill, Bonnie, Brenda, Cheryl, Cindy, Denise, Frank, Grayson, Heather, Jeff, John, 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 Kathy, Lauren, Leslie, Lynn, Marcia, Mary Jane, Michelle, Mike, Pauline, Sandra, Steve, Stephen, Thelma, Virginia and Richard, Wink, the family of Evelyn Gregonis, the family of Prue O'Donovan, victims of violence and natural disasters anywhere in the world, and we pray for peace on earth. At this time, may we turn inward for just a very few moments of silence in the midst of our public worship to offer God those prayers uh, that are better kept closer to the heart. So just a few moments of silence. Holy Savior, whose gospel covenant is what calls us together, sustains us as believers and as the church, in which we share with others, grant us courage to be ready whenever and however you need us to serve. Help us to share the story of your life and your abiding presence, and the hope that it offers to all in the world for better tomorrows, so that we don't have to settle for the way the world is today. May your realm be realized among us and also through us. Keep us ever strong through your grace and by helping us to know that our prayers are heard and that they will be answered as you alone know best. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And may we now share in the prayer that Jesus gave to all of us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Friends and neighbors, be prepared for those times when God is needed so close at hand. We hope and pray that God is always a part of everyone's lives. However, when this is not the case, they need to know where to turn to find and share in the nearness of God. There needs to be a constant presence and a reminder that God dwells among God's people. This is one of the callings that we have as church. We have stood at the center of this community for over 300 years, trying our very best to share the light of Christ. It is our contributions, our pledges through stewardship, and the work that we do for this church that have allowed for this to be true and allows for us to hope that it will, bring, that will continue to be true long into the future. Therefore, may our contributions be as generous as our faith expects and as our conditions in life allow, and donations will be accepted now in person, or if you're joining us via Zoom or later via FCAT, you can always mail in any kind of contribution to the church. However you give, it is appreciated. <laughs>
these offerings now to be placed in your sanctuary as a symbol of our love for you and for all others. This is the long weekend of Veterans Day. And on Veterans Day weekend, we honor all of those who served, who placed their lives in danger's way to protect the ideals of our freedom and our democracy, some even offering the supreme sacrifice of their lives. We also are called upon for that kind of dedication and that kind of service, no matter what, and those are those messages of be prepared. But we hope that also our ordinary preparedness through this church helps in all that God would have us do. So thank you for the way you continue to support this church, this congregation, and may God bless these gifts to his purposes, we pray. Amen. And our reflecting hymn today is Blue Hymnal, number 621, for the healing of the nations. for today is from Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 through 13. And Jesus said, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and fell asleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. And then all the bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went away to buy it, the bridegroom arrived. And those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. And later the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us too. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. You know, sometimes on a, on a Sunday, I'll say that, you know, some particular reading is just ex 
you know, just outstandingly important and relevant and, and, and sacred to me in, in the way I read the Bible on a daily basis. And some of those just like kind of jump off the page and they're meaningful. And some of those Sundays it's easy to preach. And then you got other Sundays like today where the readings just aren't my favorites. <laughs> okay, they're just not my favorites. And so I actually asked the Bible study group on Tuesday, Monday, one of those days, this past week, Monday or Tuesday, and we met, and I asked them in particular about a reading that we did not choose. I chose the alternate because I asked them about that particular reading, and I said, within the context of the few minutes, and I got my eye on the clock, so I'm going to watch that, but within the context of our few minutes of sermon, can we put this reading in a meaningful context? And that conversation went on for, I bet you, 15 minutes or more, and so I figured if that's going on in a Bible study class, back and forth, back and forth, then there's no way that I can do it any kind of justice in the amount of time for a sermon. So I, I didn't choose that reading. It's a, very, it's a powerful reading, but the context that it takes to form that powerful reading, you just can't do it here. And so I chose the alternate reading that Donna read for us earlier, uh, the one from the prophet Amos. So that's one story about these readings are tough this week. The other one is today's gospel, um, you know, about the ten bridesmaids. I, I got to tell you, I have a tough time with that. And I'm a middle-aged white male, and I have a tough time with this gospel. Um, the idea is, is that the ten bridesmaids, they, they go out with their lamps and they, they're supposed to wait for the groom to arrive. And then they escort the groom to the bride who's already at the banquet. And it's supposed to be this joyous occasion. Well, 2,000 years ago, we got to remember that the situation with men and women is a lot different than it is today. And, and just to kind of highlight that, there's a, court, there's a case right before the Supreme Court now. And it's about this guy down in Texas. And the guy down in Texas is a, has a de domestic abuse charges against him. He, he likes to beat up on women. And so because of that, the, the state took his guns away. And the guy loves his guns more than he loves the women in his life. And so he's gone all the way up to the Supreme Court for, to have his guns back. And the way that the Supreme Court seems to be arguing is that those guns, the laws that, the, that you pass for gun laws in 2023, they have to be able to apply in some way, somehow, to the, the, the real life situation of the country in 1793. And so you figure like 250 years ago. But remember, 250 years ago, when they said all men are created equal, they literally meant all men. You women did not count, okay? Women were not people. They were, according to the law, you were possessions. And a husband could do whatever he wanted with his possessions. And so there would never be a domestic abuse case in 1793 because I'm married to Sharon. If I want to go home in 1793 and smack Sharon around just because I'm not happy, I'll smack Sharon around. In 2023, if I go home and smack Sharon around, Sharon smacks me around even harder. All right, so the world has changed. And I don't understand how you can just take 1793 and plop it into 2023. It makes no sense to me. But let's go even further back in time, to the time of Jesus, when women seriously just did not matter as individuals. You were either your father's daughter or you were your husband's wife. You were never just you. And so now you got these bridesmaids. And I'm wondering in this story, and this is why I, I have such a problem with this story of getting to the message of be prepared, because I have a problem with the story. You know, the, the ten bridesmaids are out there doing what they're supposed to do. And this guy, on his big day, just seems to take, you know, I, I'll show up when I show up. And so they wait so long that the ten bridesmaids, all ten, ten of them, they fall asleep waiting for this guy to arrive. They got a whole banquet full of people that are held hostage that they're waiting for this guy to arrive. Finally, he shows up and they, they have to turn on their lights and I can't, I don't have enough oil. So they say, go out and buy some more oil at the oil dealer. Yeah, there's going to be an open oil dealer in some Nazareth town at midnight. And so this whole thing is just silly. It's just silly to me and I can't get past all of these details to get to that message of be prepared. So what does, what happens to that message of be prepared is we kind of, we just chop it up and, and we serve it the way we want. And in a lot of churches, especially at this time of the year, because we're coming to the end of the church year, and we're starting to talk about the end of time and judgment, and God becomes scarier and scarier and scarier. And, you know, as God gets scary, the idea of a loving, compassionate, 
walk with you through life, God goes farther into the background. And so this idea of judgment and be prepared, they're always linked. And I wish they weren't, because it's not what we're trying to get across with this gospel message of Jesus. And so be prepared. Why? Because Jesus is going to come at the second coming, and he's going to come down with great power and everything else. And then as soon as he comes down, all the people who are not in Jesus' tribe, they're all going to be you know, thrown away where? To eternal hell, where I don't care what happens to them. Let them burn because they were not prepared. Or maybe it's this idea of be prepared because you never know when your last moment of life is going to come. So on my way from here back to North Amherst, I, I run into a telephone pole, and I die just like that. i got to meet Jesus today. And you know, you all heard those stories about you. I hope you know you, what you're wearing is clean and all that. Well, I'm going to meet Jesus. I'm going to meet Jesus. I hope I got a soul that's clean. And again, it, that whole idea about being scared of God is just not where God is at. You know, I was not the biggest, brawniest kid in the schoolyard. And so if there was a bully, I was the nicest kid in the world to the bully. Not because I liked the bully, but because I was afraid of the bully. And so do we want to really have a God that we're so afraid of that we have to be nice to that God because we're afraid of that God? Do I really care about the bully? No. And so do we want to have a God that we equate love of God and fear of God is the exact same thing? Jesus would not allow that, and that's why Jesus came into the world. So what does be prepared mean? I think we have to go to the story of Amos. Amos is even further back in time than Jesus, but his timelessness is still there. So this is the prophet, the first written prophet. He, he changes everything when you get the written book of Amos. And Amos is writing at a time when Israel has got a big social divide. There's the very wealthy and the very poor. And the very wealthy are getting wealthier, the very poor are getting poorer. Sound at all familiar? And you know what else is happening? Is everybody's going to the shrine. So all of this is happening outside the world, but inside the shrine, people are still coming. And what happens is the prophet hears this message from God in a world where the outside does not match what's going on in the inside. And God says to his prophet, God says, I hate I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Take away from me the noise of your songs, your choirs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, your organ. Instead, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That's what be prepared means. It doesn't mean just come here to a sanctuary like Amos is talking about and pay your respects to God and forget about everything that's going on in the world. Be prepared means that we have to change the world out there so that just like Jesus came and talked about, you know, fighting for the oppressed, you know, including the ones who are pushed aside, helping the impoverished, you know, sharing all those wonderful messages that Jesus said about uplifting the poor, all those things, we have to do that out there to make this meaningful. If all we do is sit in here and sing pretty songs and say pretty prayers and don't care about what's going on in the world, God says to us, I hate, I despise your festivals, I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. So be prepared is that holy message that we have one life of faith that is not divided by church walls and that we have to live the faith that we talk about here, we have to live it out there. And that's be prepared and I hope and I pray that we can live into that message of a full-time Christian faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our hymn of closing today is Red Hymnal number 181. And Anthony, even though we said that from Amos and you're our, our, our music director, how many verses do you want to do? All four of the short. OK, thanks for the help, Anthony. Four verses. <laughs>
thank you all for coming out for this Sunday worship, and I hope the rest of your Sunday is a, is a blessed one and the rest of your week as well. Let us now share in our benediction response and our congregational response after that. May we strive to help each other live in complete loyalty and devotion to God. May God's unconditional love inspire us to live our faith joyously. And may our worship continue wherever we go. Jesus is the seal of the faithful covenant between God and all of creation. His counsel is the light that we need to guide us when the world grows dark. We will take time throughout the week to rest in God's promises and to listen for God's still speaking word. So let us now go forth to love and serve the Lord in all we do among all whom we may meet. Amen.